this earth. Uh, he was uh, speaking to his disciples when he left them in the Great Commission. It says that Jesus, in Matthew 28, it says that Jesus came up and spoke to him, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age.
this song this morning, and as soon as this song is over, I'm going to ask Lynn if she'll come forward for the uh, special music. We're going to try. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Stand up. This is a great song to stand up here. <laughs> Evelyn, can you turn on Marcus' mic, please? Thank you. Right now. <clears throat>
let's turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We're going to begin it in verse 15. Now, this is, you know, John 21 is kind of like an epilogue of the Gospel of John. The resurrection actually occurred in chapter 20. You think being Easter Sunday, that's what I would preach. But this is one of Jesus' resurrection appearances to his disciples. He had told them to go on ahead from Jerusalem to Galilee and meet him there. And uh, he's uh, delayed a little bit. And, uh, you know, Peter, uh, if you remember correctly, Peter had failed miserably on the night that Jesus was tried before he was crucified, and he denied the Lord three times. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think the resurrection actually made Peter want to quit. Because how could he face Jesus now that he was alive, knowing how miserably he had failed? And so Jesus meets them, you know, and Jesus, uh, at the beginning of chapter 21, uh, you know, when Peter decides he's going to quit, he says, look, look guys, I'm going back to fishing. That's what I was doing before. I'm going back to fishing. They didn't catch anything all night. He, he brought the disciples with him, the other disciples. They didn't catch anything. And, and just like when Jesus called the disciples the first time, he says, uh, Jesus shows up and he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And so they cast it and they caught so many fish they could barely haul them in and the nets weren't breaking. And it reminded them of the day that Jesus called them the first time. And so Jesus was restoring their calling when, when he was, met them there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. But you know, Peter had failed so miserably, he needed a little extra restoration. And sometimes I think we all need that. You know, the gospel, it, it calls sinners to commit, to submit fully to Christ. And, and to you, you actually don't find your life until you lose it in Christ. You know, how many people have you heard of, well, I'm going to go off to, to Europe for a couple of years and try to find myself or whatever. I don't know anybody with that much money, but, you know, people do that, apparently. And, and uh, but the only way to truly find yourself is to lose yourself in Christ. And, and <clears throat> we, we live our life to the fullest when we actually empty ourselves and take up the cross and follow Christ. You know, the, the question that Christians should ask is not what do I want to do with my life, but it's what does Jesus want me to do with my life. And, and here the Lord appeared to them, and he's got to restore Peter. And what we find out is that there are three callings that God places on all of our lives. A, a resurrected Jesus demands three things of those who would follow him. And, and, and that is, you see the main idea there in that handout that I gave you. The resurrected Lord Jesus calls you to a life of loving, sacrificing for, and following him. So let's look at these callings. We find the first one there in verses 15 through 17. Well, actually, let's just read the whole passage. Let's stand up here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> it's Easter, okay? You know, I'm excited. Uh, beginning in verse 15, God's Word says, So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, and I just want to remind you, how many times did, did Peter deny Jesus? Okay, so pay attention to how many times Jesus is going to ask Peter if he loves him, okay? He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished, but when you grow old, 
You will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. Uh, by the way, this, the disciple whom Jesus, whom Jesus loved is the way John referred to himself. So he's, he's the author of this book that we're reading. Uh, Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. The one who also had leaned on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is it? Who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose even the world would not contain the books that would be written. Father, we ask your blessing upon your word. I pray, Lord, that you would take it and, and drive it deep in our hearts. And Lord, that I pray that you help us to leave this place fully surrendered to you. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So the first thing we see in verses 15 through 17 is that you are called to a life of loving Jesus. Now I want to ask you, is, is loving Jesus a big deal? You know, it, it is actually the most important thing that you can do with your life. Lo loving Jesus is the most important thing that we can do. Uh, remember when, when Jesus, because Jesus is God, right? So when, when Jesus, you remember he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember what he said? It was in Matthew 22, 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the greatest commandment is to love God. So then by implication, what would be the greatest sin you could commit? To not love God. You see, you can come in here and you can and love the music, you can love the singing, you can love the preaching, you can, you can love everything that we do, but if you leave here without loving Jesus, you've missed the whole point of being here. As a matter of fact, loving Jesus is such a big deal. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, that if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. In other words, if you don't love the Lord, that's a sign that you're lost and you don't belong to Him. And so that, that's a big deal. It's the most important thing you can do. And our love for Jesus is shown through our obedience to Him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then in John chapter 5, and verse 3, uh, sorry, 1 John 5, 3, the Apostle John says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. What, what does that mean? If, if you love the Lord, you will keep His commandments and they are not burdensome. That means that it's a joy for you to obey the Lord because you love Him so much. So it, 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 that's a way to tell if you love the Lord. But then, we see that all of us, like Peter, have failed in our love for Jesus and need to be restored. How many of you woke up this morning loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? You know, if you did, you're doing better than most of us. You know, because, you know, if you got a house full of kids to get ready, you know, what, what's on your mind? You know, uh, think, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the baptistry may not be working perfectly like it's supposed to work. Or, you know, the, the PowerPoint might mess up. And, and, and you lose, you know, you get so easily distracted. And you get caught up in doing things. And, and you forget to just love the Lord. You know, Peter, I like the way Jesus did this. 
He didn't, you remember, Jesus had changed Simon's name to Peter, right? And every time Peter messed up, Jesus calls him Simon. <clears throat> it, it, you know, it's like when your mom brings out your middle name, right? It, 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 he's telling Peter, are you going back to your old ways? You know, you, you denied me three times, Simon. Like, are, are you really not Peter, the, the rock? And, and then, you know, you're acting like your old self, but then he asks him this question, do you love me more than these? What are these? More than these. Peter liked to go fishing. You, you know, you got the boats and the nets and all that stuff. Peter, do you love me more than you love fishing? Peter, do you love me more than, than you love all the things of this world? You got that. That's a tough question a lot of times. And then, the first time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? He uses the word uh, agapeo in Greek, which means do you love me supremely? Do you, do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me more than anything else? And, and Peter, when he answers back, he doesn't use the same word. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I... And he uses the word phileo, which is the word for brotherly love or affectionate love. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, he, see, Peter can't, he knows his failure. He can't admit to the kind of love that he's supposed to have. But he at least admits that he has an affection for the Lord. And he's just being honest with Jesus. And I, and I think if all of us would just be honest with Jesus about where we are, we could, we could begin to grow. And, and, and make progress in our Christian life. But he's, you know, he, he says, you know, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. I love you. And he says, well, tend my lambs. It's this idea of pastoring his sheep, you know, being, being like a pastor to those who he follows. You see, Peter had failed so miserably, and God was, and Jesus was calling Peter to be the leader of the disciples, the leader of the the early church there in Jerusalem, and he needed, and he failed publicly, so he needed to be restored publicly. And, and here Jesus restoring him back to his position. So, you know, Peter, you know, if, if that's the best you can do, I'll accept it. And he asked him a second time, Peter, do you agape of me? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter slips back to that other word. Lord, you, you know. That I feel like of you. I, I, I have affection for you. And then he says, shepherd my sheep, which is basically the same thing. The third time, Jesus uses Peter's word. Peter, do you even feel like of me? Do you even really have affection for me? And, you know, think about it. Peter, you were there by the campfire. You denied me three times. You even cursed on the third time when you denied me. Do you even really have affection for me? Peter, he says, Lord, you know all things. He the feelings that Jesus is omniscient, that Jesus is God, and that Jesus can search his heart and know exactly how he feels. Lord, you, you know I love you, but... Peter realizes something. Without God's empowerment, it's impossible to love God the way you ought to love Him. You need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see Peter get that empowerment on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when he stands up for the Lord. That the Holy Spirit moves in and empowers him to love the Lord the way you ought to love Him. He says, you know, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tim, my sheep, and, and, and Jesus leaves it there. Peter is now restored. But the point is that you, you are called to a, a life of loving Jesus. But then you are called to a, a, a life of sacrificing for Jesus. Now that Peter is restored, look at what Jesus tells him. It, it, and you, I would have to, you know, after being restored like that and to get this kind of news, 
you do, you'll be kind of devastated. But, but Peter, when he, when he gets empowered with the Holy Spirit, we see him, you know, taking this and, and being and rejoicing in it, living a life of faithfulness to the Lord. But here's what Jesus says about a life of sacrifice that Peter is going to have to offer. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. This he signified, uh, now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. When he spoke in this, he said to him, follow me. You know what Jesus is telling Peter? Peter, your love for me is going to be tested. And it's going to be tested supremely. You're going to have to give the ultimate sacrifice. You know, you used to walk around and go wherever you wanted to go, but, but following me means you go where I want you to go. And one of these days, somebody's going to take you and, and they're going to bind you and they're going to nail you to a cross just like they did me. That's what Jesus is telling Peter, that he's going to die. By crucifixion, just like Jesus died. And in church tradition, several of the early church fathers let us know that Peter, when it, when it came time for him to die, the Holy Spirit filled him so much that he told those who were crucifying him that he was not worthy to die the same way that Jesus did to crucify him upside down. And so Peter died crucified upside down. He was willing to pay that sacrifice. You know, a, a, a life of sacrifice is a life of self-denial. He, he always went where he wanted to go, but then, you know, following Jesus means you go where Jesus wants you to go. And a life of sacrifice may require the ultimate sacrifice. And, and a life of sacrifice should be welcomed by all Christians. Paul tells us in Philippians 1.29, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. We should rejoice when we get to suffer for Christ. But you know what? For most of us, it's not going to look like what it did for Peter. It'll look more like what it did for John. A, a, a life of just, you know, raising kids to be faithful to the Lord, or you know, going to work every day, witnessing the best we can. Uh, just, just a life of everyday faithfulness is what it will look like for most of us to follow Jesus. But it could require that ultimate sacrifice. And then you are called to a life of following Jesus. Verses, verse 20. Peter, Peter does something that a lot of preachers like to do. He, he turns around it says, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following him, the one who also had leaned on his bosom at the supper, and said, Lord, who is, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? You follow me. You know, a life of following Jesus is a unique life. Now what us pastors like to do is we look at these other other pastors and well I work just as hard as that guy. How come he's got a church with 3,000 people? You know I love the Lord just as much as that pastor. Do you ever get envy of another Christian because they seem to have a better life than you do? That's what Jesus is addressing here. Peter, you're going to have to die for me. Well, if I'm going to have to die for you, what about this guy back here? And, and, and what Jesus is saying is that he calls us each individually to a unique life of discipleship. What following Jesus looks like for me may not look exactly the same for you. He's, he's called me a pastor, but he's, he's not going to call everybody here to be a pastor. You, you, can, you can, you know, work a, a nine-to-five job and, and be just as faithful to the Lord as a pastor or a missionary or anybody else. And, and you may even get more reward in heaven than the pastor if you're faithful in, in living the life that God has called you to do. 
I was, uh, you know, thinking about this, and you know, there's this C.S. Lewis and his uh, story, a horse and his boy. You know, this Aslan who represents God. He's telling Shasta about all the ways that he's been working in his life, sovereignly working and, and doing everything. And, and and Shasta says, you know, the, you know, it must have been you who, who, who wounded Aramis. And, and Aslan says, yeah, it was me. And, and Shasta says, why did you do that? And, and Aslan says, well, that's his story. I only tell you your story. See, we can't be worried about what God is doing necessarily in other people's lives other than just help them. We have to follow Jesus to what he has called us individually to do. Well, I want to close by one thing. I was reminding you of one thing. The, these callings, these three callings to love Jesus, to sacrifice for Jesus, to live a life of following Him. You see, th these are not optional. It's not like there's a light version of Christianity and then like a super version of Christianity. I want you to hear what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8. And I didn't give these verses to Randy, so they won't be on the screen. So I want you to listen carefully. Here, here Jesus is talking about discipleship and it says, and he's in Mark 8 34, it says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples. And what does that mean? It means this is for everybody. Not just the super group of Christians called disciples. He summoned the crowd. This is for everybody. And he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So what does that mean? If you're going to follow Jesus, what do you have to do? Take up a cross and follow him. Right? You say, well, you know, I, I, I said a sinner's prayer when I was eight years old, but, you know, I, I, I haven't really followed the Lord since then. Then you might want to ask, are you really saved? Because look at what Jesus says following this. You know, if, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the world and to forfeit his soul? You see, what, what Jesus is doing, he's saying that if you're really saved, if you're really a Christian, you'll follow me. You don't just look back to a prayer that you said when you were eight years old. The, the evidence is in that you follow Jesus. And so, some of us need to think about that this morning. Are we following Jesus? Are we living faithfully to Him? So we're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a moment. And I'm going to invite you, if you want to follow Jesus, you say, Lord, I, I, I'm tired of living my own way. I want to surrender my life to Jesus and follow him. If you come forward, I'll share with you from the Bible how you can be saved. You become a follower of Jesus. Let's pray. Amen.